Amen, amen. Give it up for Jesus one time. Give it up for Jesus one time. So I am truly, I'm truly, truly honored, as, as Elder Brooks always says, to, to have this opportunity to serve um, for you guys this morning. Thank you to our visionaries, Bishop and First Lady, for allowing me this opportunity uh, this morning. Um, so today we're going to talk about a, a story that, that you're probably familiar with. And, and if you're not familiar with the story, I promise you will be um, before this service is over. But we talk about the, uh, the prodigal son. And I don't have time to read the entire passage, but I will drill down on the, ver on the verse 20, where it says, So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. So a little bit of context before we get to the prodigal son. Uh, Jesus, in chapter 14, he is just coming from a dinner, eating with the Pharisees, some of the religious leaders at that time. And so in verse 15, we see in chapter 15, we see where he's starting to sit with some of the most debaucherous sinners of this time and some of the tax collectors. So while he's eating dinner with the Pharisees, they don't have access to Jesus because they're not allowed to go into this banquet. And so what Jesus is saying here is now is that you have access to me no matter is what you've done. But as he's sitting here with these sinners, then the Pharisees begin to question his actions. And in fact, they even don't even reverence who he is. And they say, this man sits with this group of people and he claims to be who he is. And so it's hard for them to understand why Jesus is doing what he's doing when they don't even reverence who he is. And so as, as Jesus is sitting with them, he begins to tell these three parables. And he starts with the parable of the, the lost sheep and, and the parable of a lost coin. And then he goes into the parable, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, what's interesting is that all three of these parables are dealing with restoration. But in the first two parables, uh, the restoration is not given by Jesus. And the reason he does it this way is because he wants to bring their understanding to a level. So when he gets to the prodigal son, they can understand what it is that he's doing. And so we get to the prodigal son and Jesus tells this illustration. And though it's an illustration, the characters in this parable are all too real. So you have the younger son who's being represented by the sinners and, and you have the father being represented by Jesus himself. And the older son is a representation of the Pharisees. Somebody say that's an all star cast anytime Jesus is in it. And so and, and so and so, you know, you know, the story, you know, the story, the younger son comes up to his father and he says, give me my inheritance. Now, there's an issue with this request, because back in that time, in order to get your inheritance, someone had to die. And two, the inheritance normally went to the older son. So what the younger son is telling his father at this point in time is that I no longer need your services, dad, that I'm ready to be independent. I think in this day we call it emancipation. And so and so his father, knowing that his son is not able to handle this, he still grants the request because he gives him this opportunity to exercise his free will. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs 20 and 21 and 20 that an inheritance that is received too soon turns out not to be a blessing. Somebody say you got to pay for your mistakes. And so he gives them his inheritance. And the younger son, the Bible says, he goes to a far off country and he spends everything that he has. And the Bible says he took everything that he had with him, which means he didn't have any intentions on returning back home. And so as he gets to this far off land, the Bible says that his money runs out and the time that the money runs out, that a famine hits the land. And somebody say the struggle is real. <laughs> and so as he runs out of money, it says that he links up with somebody from this country that he ran to. The same people that helped him get in the situation is the same ones that he decides to run to. So you have to be careful who you run to when you find yourself down and out. And so the man that he runs to sends him to go feed the pigs. Because see, man looks at economy while God looks at eternity. And so as the younger son is sitting there feeding these pigs, he comes to his senses, the Bible says. And when he comes to his senses, the Bible says that he gets up and he begins to come home. And as he's on his way home, it says the father sees him while he's a ways out there. Which means one thing, that the father was expecting his return, but the father was waiting on his return. See, the issue that we have when we turn our back on God is that we placed ourselves in a position where we can't even recognize when he's watching our back. And so the Bible says that the father runs to his son. So what that means to us is that the minute you decide to repent, that immediately the father will respond and run to you and he will embrace you. He will grab you and he will kiss you. And the Bible says that when the son sees his father, he says, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your servants. But see, the father had other plans. Just because you're out of pocket don't mean you've lost your position in his kingdom. And so the Bible says that the father has a big celebration for his younger son. 
And as this celebration is going on, there's the other character that I mentioned earlier that we haven't talked about, and that's the older son. And just like the Pharisees question Jesus' action, the older son does the same thing with his father, and he questions the actions. And he walks up to his father and he says, I've done everything that you've asked me to do, and you have not even killed a goat for me. But the father, what's most and beautiful about this parable is that the father offers him the same thing that he offered his younger son. And he's, what he's telling his older son is that you're not justified by your works. I just need you to accept grace. All I need is for you to accept grace. God bless you.